This podcast is part of E2C Network, where we share the whole Auburn experience. Where are you go, Auburn fans? Welcome to No Huddle, your source for Auburn football news and discussion. Part of the E2C Network. It is Corn Dog Hating Week. I, I personally love corn dogs, but I'm going to hate them this week. And I've brought along Kyle Loomis. Jared is out. Uh, he is doing some fun things with his family, uh, but he should be ne- back next week. So in his stead, Kyle Loomis, I brought you in. Excited to hear uh, what's your thoughts on LSU. Uh, any kind of initial reactions to the hate week? Oh, before all that, we got to acknowledge some things off the top here. I also am a lover of corn dogs, uh, <laughs> but not the variety of smell that emanates from Baton Rouge, which is still to this day interesting. It is. That you you can roll. Literally, I rolled my window down driving past Baton Rouge through it almost on the way to a wedding in Texas within the last year. And it smells like corn dogs. I it's don't, wild. Don't understand it, AJ. I it don't. Doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like the the food itself that they cook for their cookouts. And I've been to a handful that have LSU fans. It doesn't like you would think uh, you visually look at it. That doesn't scream corn dog smell to me. It smells like Cajun spice. It would be spicier smelling, wouldn't it? Like, you know, yeah. And of course it's, it is that whatever, but what's funny is I had a tradition in college. I don't know if you even knew this Kyle. I remember this. Um, I would eat a corn dog the week of, and if we won, it was my celebra- celebration, so I'd eat another. Um, so, yeah, it's just part of it. It sounds like my tradition of eating Taco Bell regardless after an Auburn uh, football game. It's either <laughs> celebratory Taco Bell or it's pity Taco Bell. And, a lot, you know, <laughs> last two years has been a lot of pity Taco Bell. And uh, yeah, you could tell by the stomach growing that there was I, – I went a little too heavy on the pity Taco Bell. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, hey, we all got our things with, uh, you know, coping with uh, an Auburn loss or even sometimes victory, you know, you might splurge a little extra. So can I, can I, before we get into the show, I just want to acknowledge is, is Jared Davis where I think he is right now? He is. He's at the most beautiful and amazing place in the whole United States. Besides oh, Auburn. Auburn, Alabama. No, I Auburn. <laughs> uh, the other place, Disney world, huh? I know. Yeah. I'm so jealous of him right now. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I'm a huge Disney World fan. If you probably followed me long enough, you know, figured that out about me. But uh, yeah, he in our little group text when uh, AJ asked me to cover this week for Jared and said where he was, I was like, "Excuse me, <laughs> yeah, and you don't tell me that you're going." <laughs> Anyway, just want to yeah. say, Jared, if you're listening to this, I hate you. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> pink slips in the mail. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's actually talk about the game itself. So we, we've we got our game time. It's going to be 6 o'clock uh, Central Time in Baton Rouge. It's a night game. Uh, always a little scary with Baton Rouge. But really, I want to ask you, does that scare you much more than going to any other SEC powerhouse? Only because of personal experiences that I had, my wife Jessica had when we went to our one trip and probably only trip ever to Baton Rouge mm-hmm. and several others from the BCM and that uh, trip we all took together. Uh, it, it, it's a scary place in general. Nighttime, when they've had extra time for the booze to set in, mm. it gets a little bit more uncomfortable in ways. So in terms of creating a football atmosphere and a rowdy atmosphere, yes, uh, that does seem to favor LSU a lot. And they call it Death Valley for a reason. Yep. Um, Does it make a big difference this year? That's a great question, but it's more informed by the question of which LSU team is going to show up. Oh yeah, and that that's the big question. So I don't. To, there is a it's a non answer for me. Does it make the difference or not? Because I just don't know who's going to show up. Yeah, and if it is the Jaden Daniels throws for 400 yards, that's not good for Auburn. But if it's a game where we harass him or we establish the run game and also have a little bit of a pass game to balance it out a little bit, you know, it could be something where we're battling. And you saw it against Georgia, which I think Georgia is a better team than LSU at this point. And yet we were able to stay with Georgia. I do question, and this is you know part of my concern with this game, not only is it an away game, it's a night game, but kind of on top of that is what is Peyton Thorne going to do away? Because he seems to be having some issues. People mm-hmm. have kind of looked back, even at Michigan State when he was there, had some issues. 
I I think it's a mental thing. Typically, when it comes to those issues away, I hope he can kind of grow out of that. And I honestly, I would love, obviously, a win at LSU. I mean, two years ago, Brian Harson gave us the best gift ever, his only real gift of winning in Baton Rouge and finally breaking the streak. Besides that, I don't know how much he actually gave us, but besides bad rec- recruiting classes, so. <laughs> I think we get everybody stirred up already on the show. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Um, there was one other thing Brian did for us. Uh, th- that's his coup de gras. Ooh, look, French. Um, for Baton Rouge. <laughs> uh, that That is his big accomplishment. There was one other thing I can't remember. It's not really relevant to our conversation here. So He beat Georgia what- State with – K, uh tj he he made georgia state a game and that is not an accomplishment so uh with that in mind yeah um oh he, I, he, I, he almost took bama that's yeah, true it's not, an, it's, it's not it's an accomplishment he, he you know, didn't he win didn't, right yeah i i don't know uh i would love for us to continue the streak well, there's no streak unless you have two in a row. It doesn't seem like it's in Auburn's favor. You pointed out the issues of Peyton Thorne uh, on the road. We had two games on the road with him, and both yep. have been less than spe- – well, uh, you know, I-, I can't attest to the California game as much because I had a lot going on during that game and uh, was not able to pay attention as fully as I normally do. But I did watch that Texas A&M game. And yes, I saw a horrendous game played by a our quarterback, but I also saw a horrendous game played by a whole offense. And yeah. the coaching of it, the decision you make, it was a complete failure on all accounts. But we like to lump a lot of things on our quarterbacks. <laughs> Let's not go down that road, Kyle, yeah. on this show. But <laughs> um, yes, there is seems to be a history of Peyton Thorne struggling on the road. A lot of other people who think a little bit more deeply about these things and don't just stop there when they find their scapegoat is you'll find that a lot of times when Peyton Thorne has lacked support around him, a.k.a. a running game at Michigan State, that's when the things start to fall apart. He was trying to do too much, you know, feeling not supported, similar to a Bo Nix, mm, mm-hmm. you know? And look at so, Bo Nix now. So here's the here's the thing. Since you brought – I know we're kind of already getting into the weeds here, but the Peyton Thorne discussion needs to be tabled until we really get through this game. Now, if we see three games in a row of – him just looking absolutely horrible then we can probably start having discussions about we got to find some way to help this kid get right on on the uh, away game situation but we are still an offense and a team trying to find an offensive identity and that's not a fair judgment on a quarterback who's coming in late didn't get here until like part of the summer yeah and an offense that's trying to figure out their identity an offensive line that's still still not as good as it needs to be yes we're always going to focus on is Peyton Thorne going to struggle or is he the the really the problem there because it's the quarterback they get the most praise and the most lumped on them oh yeah in the bad times but I think right now I'm going to use my favorite word people are literally like rolling their eyes because they've heard it on the live streams patience folks <laughs> just have patience that's all I'm yeah. asking yeah and even Jared and I have discussed this. It even the last game, there were six passes where it hit the wide receiver's hands. Yep, should have been caught, or at you know at least some of those caught. It's it's like the old verbiage: if it hits your hands, you got to catch it. And so there's there is some expectation put upon the quarterback at any big Division One school that you do good and you are essentially how if the team's doing great you're the best person on the team. If you're not, you're the problem. And so that's the expectation that people have. I don't think that's necessarily right because one person doesn't make up a whole team, especially in these scenarios where it is a set of wide receivers. And what's kind of interesting is you're starting to see, it seems like fewer and fewer wide receivers that are getting actual good game action Mm -hmm. Uh, because the the coaching staff is saying some of these guys just aren't even cutting it. And I, I think that should be a little bit more of a focus on than Peyton Thorne. And is he getting the completion percentage that people are expecting? Or is it he's hitting the guys where they're supposed to be and they're just not catching it? Yeah. I think there's a difference. Yeah. There's a lot going on that needs to be fixed, needs to be worked on. And if you listen to the coaches, they're telling you that, folks. Oh, yeah. Well, just, and just listen. Hugh Freeze is 
about as straightforward with a lot of this kind of stuff. I mean, he, he's not going to shy away. Sometimes, you know, sometimes coaches will say, eh, I'm going to have to go back and look at it. And maybe one of the players did something right. And some of them did wrong. Like they're going to be very vague about it. Sometimes Hugh Freeze can be very open about this guy did it wrong. And we need to go figure that out. Right. And that's, that's something I feel like not many coaches in general have that ability, but mm-hmm. here we are. Hugh Freeze are. is doing it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, LSU offense and defense, um, and then we'll get into our players to watch. Uh, LSU's offense right now, they're averaging 551 total yards Woo. per game. Ugh. Ugh. That That's a lot. Yeah. Um, but I think, based on what I've seen from our defense, we can slow them down. Mm-hmm. What's reasonable, though? Is it like 300 yards? That would be tough, right? Yeah. But if we can get them down to 400 yards and keep them, I don't know, say under 30 points, sure, we got a shot. Yeah. Um, you put a few drives together, our defense caused a few you know, turnovers, something could happen. You know, it's, it's Death Valley. It's got the juju or the voodoo magic going on down there. Uh, we don't have the old less miles eating grass stuff going on, but uh, it is it is a interesting character like Brian Kelly head coaching, and uh, I don't know. It's, we it's just got weird. the we got the northerner trying to act like a southerner now. That's that's weird enough as it is. True, <laughs> His second season as the head coach. I, it, it, it feels like he's been there a long time, but he hasn't. It's just weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that offense that LSU has is quite intimidating. The question is, will Auburn's defense be as good as advertised so far? Yep. Uh, say, especially with the injuries right yes. now. Injury, in that, so you, you wonder, what would the game have been like if Auburn was completely healthy on defense against Georgia? And yeah. I think, unfortunately, we're going to have a similar scenario here where we ask at the end of this, how much less damage could have LSU have done done at home? So that's going to be tough enough as it is them having the momentum of being at home as an offense. Um, if we were at full health, that's not me setting up to make an excuse LSU fans. So chill out <laughs> or Auburn fans was saying, I'm making an excuse. I'm not, I'm not just trying to set myself up for that, Yeah, but it's just the reality, you know, that this has been a surprisingly good defense for the most part when mm-hmm. they're given some offensive support, you usually kind of let the air out of the balloon when you don't get any of that. We've seen that happen time and time and time and time and time again at Auburn. That's really the matchup here. Auburn's defense versus LSU's um, offense and who will bend or break or however you'd like to phrase that. Yeah. I think 300 is a yards is a given for LSU in this game, just at home just speaks for itself. There's a lot riding on this game too. It's the last time that Auburn and LSU, as far as we know, will play on an annual basis. People are not, I think that's being missed in all of this. The tiger bowl will never be played annually as far as we know ever again after this point. Yeah. So there's a lot riding on this. Well, well, we're trying to like figure out even, are we going to do the same thing with Georgia? Like, is that, you know, that, that seems don't open to be that. more. Don't open that place, Pandora right? box, AJ. Don't I'm do not, that. I'm not going to try, but I, you know, that, I peeked it open. Uh, <laughs> one other thing that I, I think can be helpful here, because if you watch any LSU this year, their defense is subpar. It's not what I've expected out of an LSU right. defense preseason. They had a lot of returning talent. And for some reason, they're still allowing 430 yards per game. And sometimes like 700 yards per game against what was it? Ole Miss a few weeks ago. Yep. And that is something that I'm personally excited about because LSU's aver- I think they're allowing close to 200 yards rushing. If that's possible, our run game, should hit 200 yards, if not more. Right. And if we're doing that, that opens up the pass game a little bit more too. So could help uh, the, the passing game and the running game um, all included in this game. So could be high scoring. I don't honestly anticipate it. I mean, do you think it could be high scoring? I think the line, if you care about those things, is like 53 at this point, which, and, and I think they're favored on this Sunday when we're recording by 14 points. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of do the math there if you're good at that in your head right now and kind of guesstimate what the score might be based on the Vegas odds. Uh, It seems to think that LSU is going to score a lot of points and Auburn is not going to. So 
is that a high scoring game simply because LSU does? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my gut tells me that Auburn's not going to muster a lot of points, but I'm not a hundred percent sold that LSU's offense, even given what they've been able to do so far this season is going to have as easy of a time against this Ron Roberts defense. So right now, I mean, you, we talked about the big question is the matchup of Auburn's defense versus LSU's offense. Then the question becomes the opposite of that. Whose is going to be the worst out of the other two, the LSU defense, the Auburn offense. I got to think that Auburn's offense, given their bye week is going to have some things maybe understood better now, thought through now, and maybe we see, even if it's not resulting in a win, some step forwards in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Establishing a run game is extremely important to try to keep a very intoxicated and rowdy LSU fan base somewhat at bay, control the time of possession. Oh, yes. If Auburn can do those things and let, as we talked about, Peyton Thorne settle in when he maybe has a history of being nervous, make some easy throws to start off with, this thing could get interesting, especially if Auburn's defense, as we already talked about, shows up. Yeah, and and Auburn's already shown this year we can make some games interesting. When uh, even you know, I felt like most people have counted us out against Georgia, and look what we did. Now we get an extra week essentially with a bye week to prepare for LSU. Right. You got to think that's going to pay some dividends. So I wanted to transition into the players to watch. Uh, I got Jared's, um, even though he's in the one of the most amazing places besides Auburn. <laughs> it's called the most magical place on earth. Dang it, AJ. I'm and sorry, he's there I, and I I'm not that there. Up. I screwed that up. <laughs> um, right, but I'll, I'll not give you it all. Not better at all. <laughs> I gave him uh, just a text and he responded back. So offense, he was going to be lo- watching uh, receivers. He said, I think uh, Thorne is coming along and uh, they need to make some catches. So putting a little bit more emphasis on the receivers. I've got something similar. I'm going to specifically be watching Peyton Thorne. I've already alluded to this uh, just because of how much he's been, at least seemingly so far, struggling outside of Jordan Hare. So if we can get him settled early, uh, you know, even if he, for goodness sakes, I hate to say this, but he had at least 100 yards passing. Like if we can somehow do that <laughs> against this poor LSU defense, woo! Uh, I, let me go into tone. I have toned for it on the live stream. Uh, I'll do it here as well. That I made the bold statement after the first time of no, not 100 yards passing that it would never happen again. Uh, I was wrong, folks. And so don't ever say I don't <laughs> own up to it when I was wrong. Uh, I, I was wrong. I didn't think it could yeah. be done, but it was done. Now, <laughs> to their credit, they didn't necessarily, they did need to do better than that against Georgia, but yeah. the game plan they put together put them in position to win even without that. So well, anyway, we're not exactly. going to go rehash that again. That was two weeks ago at this point. Um, I guess you want my player for the yes. to watch for offense. Yes, sir. I'm going to be a little bit creative here. And I agree that we need to watch Peyton Thorne. I think the receivers are also in that, but I'm going to go not even, I'm going to name one specific player, but it's more so about three in this group. I'm going to okay. pay attention to Avery Jones, the center. Mm-hmm. I believe he's still the center. And then the two guards as well. Because if you'll think about it this way, we, in terms of running, have seen to had more success on the outside or maybe between the tackle and guard position. But up the middle, and that seems where a lot of our pressure is coming from too, we're not really doing all that great. On top of that, there's been some pretty bad snaps too in certain games. And that is in in key situations. Right. Too. Or, or whoever's at center, you know, Avery may be rotated out at this point. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been two weeks. I kind of checked out for, for the bye week as we all tend to do. I'm going to be watching the center position. So Avery Jones and those guards, because to me, it doesn't matter about who's the quarterback, who's calling the plays. If we cannot get solid offensive line play, but especially in that middle portion, pass protection, creating runs up the middle, not just stuffing at the line we will not be successful in Baton Rouge or anywhere else for that matter, even in Jordan Hare, as we saw against Georgia. So I'll say Avery Jones, but it's really that middle group, that three right there in the middle of the offensive line. Yeah. You make a good point because the the last time, and, and I think you could argue if the snaps were better against Georgia, we have an even better chance of winning that game. And that's something that I think is getting overlooked. Again, pointing towards the quarterback, Maybe some of that's warranted, but I don't think all of it is. Right. So 
spread the uh, spread the concern, I guess. Not just one player. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go on to defense uh, again, Jared. I got his uh, his input. He's going to be looking for uh, just watching this player because he thinks he's going to be key is Eugene Asante. Uh, he said he's going to need to be beast mode again, like he was against Cal. This was essentially Eugene Asante's kind of hey, I'm here. I'm I'm ready to play at the big big level. Yep. And uh especially after being on the practice squad, you know, he has made a name for himself and uh very excited to see what he can do. Um and especially you also pointed out, you know, if we can get Jaden Daniels, their quarterback, off balance at all, that's gonna be key because Jaden Daniels numbers right now are ridiculous. I'll just throw some numbers out. Seventeen hundred yards passing, sixteen touchdowns, and only two interceptions. So you got 73% passing percentage this season. Yep. So when the dude passes it, they make something happen. It almost reminds me of like the days of Alabama just throwing the ball around and <laughs> just seemingly making stuff happen. So, yeah. Uh, I'll give my defensive players to watch. And it's going to be like, it is going to be like a group because I think the pass rush is going to be key, uh, kind of going along that same vein. Um, so it's, Whoever you're going to be rushing, typically you know, think of edges. But you know, at this point, we bring a lot of safety blitzes. I think you're going to have to do that. Uh, maybe risk uh, some open wide receivers or uh, something like that. So, yeah. Uh, who do I think is going to be the player to watch here? You know, that whole only two interceptions thing looked pretty interesting to me. And I, there's one Jalen Simpson that I hey, think uh, has already done it a couple of times that might uh, want to. Not just a couple. Numbers. Yeah. Four times. Uh, yeah. War. One of the best so far defensive back wise. Um, uh, I, I really like Marcus Harris, especially in the last mm. game along the D line. He really has started to kind of make his presence felt there and he's, oh, yeah. been, he's a guy that's been here for quite some time kind of reminds and, me of like i know he's not marlon davidson but like kind of reminds me of how he plays like it is just he's there and you know he's there like defenses or offenses are trying to avoid this guy yeah i i think also too his ability to um get pressure on the quarterback and then block like he's gotten his hand up and kind mm -hmm. of tipped a few passes as well Jane Daniels with the success throwing the ball. Uh, I just, I would like to see, we've seen the guy step up at linebacker, Eugene Asante. We've seen Jalen Simpson. He's the guy right now at defensive back. Yep. Who's the guy along the line at the edge position? Marcus Harris could be that. So that's who I'm going to watch. Could, for sure. Uh, let's also talk about special teams and uh, then we'll go into our score predictions for this LSU game. So special teams, uh, Jared, said his man oscar chapman he's also my man so it's always the wonder uh, from down under yeah the that was a terrible under. australian accent crikey that, that, was, that was pretty bad they'll probably get me canceled <laughs> um i'm gonna be watching the punt returner which i think it was uh coy moore uh, a few games yeah. ago i don't think we had any punt returns against georgia which was kind of odd yeah um but hey I think that's going to be a key. We're going to have a handful if our defense stand, stands up and uh punt returner is going to be big. So Kyle, who are you going to be watching on special teams? Daggummit. I've heard how great Brian Batiste is at on special teams. He was preseason guys to watch nationally mm -hmm. and he has done some great things there, but I am ready for him to take one to the house. Yeah. You want to take the air out of an intoxicated fan base <laughs> at six, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern uh, out of LSU, take one to the house on a kickoff return. Brian Batte, we have seen you do great things on just offense. We've seen you do some great returns, but it's time, my friend, take that thing to the house on the and say, buy you Bengals. That's, That's what right. I'm saying. That's right. We're the better Tigers, and he needs to scream that in the crowd when he scores. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm sure they will hear him. When oh, they'll scored. definitely hear him. And you think about it too, if like you're expending that much energy after you run 100 yards or, or however long it, when he catches it, you know, you're like, you say it, but it never comes out because you're so out of breath. So he's like, it's like, we're the real Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's go on to our score predictions for this game. Uh, I'll, I kind of throw out some stats here before we give our predictions. So ESPN preseason had us winning 14% of their time or whatever their you know analysis is. Well, let's jump up 25%. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. 
giving us more of a shot um, according to their analytics. The line is still set at about 14, somewhere around there, points. So that, to me, kind of shows it could be kind of like the Georgia game in a way. You know, people aren't really necessarily giving a shot. And I think when Auburn's uh, kind of discounted a little bit, that's when I feel like sometimes we just play our best. Um, so preseason, Jared and, and I had L- us losing to LSU by 10 points. Jared's going to keep his uh, score prediction of losing to Georgia by 10 points. I, my gut is telling me that we can keep it close. So I'm going to actually bump that down to seven points uh, that LSU beats us. But I mean, any, anything can happen. So can I cheat a little bit? Sure. Because we do, and this is, yes, this is shameless plugging here for E2C Network stuff. We do a Thursday night show before every football game where we do like a walkthrough of stats and stuff and make predictions, not just on the score, but of like, who's going to get the most rushing yard, who's going to get an intercept, how many, you know, pump returns for, or, you know, we just go through scenarios predictions, but it results mm-hmm. in a score prediction. So I'm going to say folks, and actually you'll probably listen to this on a Thursday. So come this evening, that evening. Thursday evening. This will be like part stream. one is part one. I, I'm not going to give you my score prediction yet. So um, I do think that it will be close. Is it close the whole game through? Probably not. I could see LSU getting off to a roaring start. Huh? Roaring Tigers puns all the way around. And then also um, Auburn having to fight back in to make it a little bit respectable. Is it going to be a seven point differential? Is it going to be a 10 point that 14 point differential right now? I don't really like that Vegas is setting, but um, we'll see. We'll find out more information throughout the week at press conferences, who's healthy, who's not. Yep. I, I'm just going to say TBD on my score prediction, but I do think it's much closer than 14 points. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing that I keep going back to is I think our defense, like it has, it's it can keep us in games. And anytime that happens, you just get, need a couple extra breaks, uh, you know, turnovers, Offense has an explosive drive, something like that. All right, finally, for our final segment of the day, and I've got a, a lot of just random stuff going on here with uh, an Auburn fan perspective of the SEC. So this was one of the first weeks, uh, I think maybe the first week with a bunch of bye weeks uh, for teams, Auburn obviously included in that. So teams are getting that extra little rest. Uh, I know some other teams are getting it over the next uh, few weeks. So, We'll talk through There's not as many SEC games going on this week, but we'll talk through some of them because they got pretty spicy. They got, they got mm-hmm. some fun ones in here. Mm-hmm. So number 11, Bama beat unranked Texas A&M uh, 26 to 20. That one, I think Bama was up until really the final whistle. It felt like Texas A&M had a shot and it's in Texas A&M fans got into it. You know, that, that place, and Auburn just went to Kyle Field. I oh, am field? earning. Is that my field? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm earning more respect for that field. I feel like I didn't necessarily give it as much because Auburn seemed to just always win in Kyle Field. But I think over the last two or three years, they have built up a little bit more of that uh, fan base that really is making a difference. And I'll kind of give you a couple just interesting tidbits there as to why I think that. So Bama had a lot of pre-snap penalties. I think at least five, there might've been six. Um, That's false starts, something happening. And again, that's just either mental mistakes or the crowd. And it seemed to be way more on the crowd because Alabama looked out of sorts a lot of times. So it made me feel slightly better by getting beat by Texas in them. But, you know, that's very interesting. I'm going to say this about Texas A&M. Um, you let me down. <laughs> nah. <laughs> I knew it was coming though. Like I said, I we were sitting there watching it, and I was like, "They're gonna give me hope. They're gonna have him on the ropes, and they're gonna let it go." Yeah. And so I just went outside and did work outside because I was like, "I can't, <laughs> I can't sit." The all these people who screamed at me on live streams and said, "Oh, it's over the dynasty." I said, "Folks, yeah, do not." count your chickens before they hatch i'm gonna need to see two losses and then even then i'm not convinced that that alabama is going to be not as good as advertised now i guess being not undefeated is not as good as advertised but i look texas a&m you continue to be just this i mean on we're i know this is not live so i'm doing up and down signals juggling and just uh yeah i I continue to be disappointed by texas (laughs) a&m 
Yeah. Um, I'll mention another one. LSU beat uh, Missouri. And this one, in my mind, uh, Missouri did have a little bit of a chance. And then I think in the fourth quarter, LSU just kind of closed things out. But I was I was hoping that LSU would win this. Okay. Yep. So, so here's my logic. They lost last week to Ole Miss. They lost, lost this week to – if they had lost to Missouri, they would have been double pissed. <laughs> at, and so I'm like – I don't want a double angry uh, Bayou Bengal down there. I'd I'd rather just get them thinking, all right, we kind of figured things out, and uh, here we go. Let's just you know beat a, a a team at Auburn that's not as good, and we should be able to beat them. This I hope is, they come up with those expectations. This is like a massacre of the Tigers right now. They they played each other. Now the Tigers, Auburn, and <laughs> yeah. last year playing. The only thing that would be better if Auburn and Missouri played next week, you know, after mm-hmm. this. Uh, it's yep. just a massacre of the Tigers. Missouri is surprising some folks. Uh, I don't know that beating LSU right now would have even taken them down to the wire as they did uh, is as impressive at the be- as it is at the beginning of the season as it would be now. But obviously, congrats to Missouri for – being respect being respectable more than we thought they were going to be yeah for sure so mississippi state uh beat western michigan which good job for them but that's not the the main storyline here that i i was watching i saw will rogers their quarterback uh, at mississippi state go out uh with a kind of a shoulder arm injury something like that and he he came out they took off his shoulder pads and uh he never came back in the game curious to see like maybe by the time this podcast comes out we're recording on Sunday. Maybe something comes out about it. Uh, but I hope he does well because yep. I, mean, I think as he goes, that's the way Mississippi State will go. And, you know, I, I want a decent matchup against them. I don't want some backup quarterback. But if we have to face a backup quarterback, I'm not going to lie. I mean, beating Mississippi State isn't it, like we've had some struggles with that recently. So, <laughs> Yeah, don't bring that up. I'll get mad. Okay. Um, another one, uh, Ole Miss beat unranked uh, Arkansas. Um, barely squeaked that one out. Lots lower game, a lower scoring game too. Yeah. And uh, good for Ole Miss. Uh, I was talking to an Ole Miss fan, and he was just happy that they got the W. I think Ole Miss, fan, Ole Miss is, again, similar to like LSU here. They are either really good or they are really bad. Uh, there's no in between. So it's just a matter of who you get. And Arkansas is surprisingly kind of being like that too. They can look really good. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this was such a close game. You know, two teams that can be so hot and so cold. And it's just a matter of how it all lines up Mm -hmm. um, and kind of maybe cancel each other's, oh, this is weird, hotness out and coldness, you know? (laughs) Um, So when I saw this 27, 20, I was like, "Eh, that makes about pretty much sense there. Yep. Um, And then Georgia, I think after uh, us disappointing, yeah, they were they were yeah they were struggling you know against Auburn, and they just said, "Nah, we're gonna just demolish Kentucky." So, uh, pretty crazy stuff going on there. Uh, not really. Can, I mean, can I can I just Kentucky? Yeah. Come on, y'all want to be respected. Mm-hmm. Y'all don't want to be just a basketball school. Y'all look pretty good preseason, follow through with it, and leading up to this game, and you give up twenty. I think it was at least twenty one straight. You know, I know it was in Georgia. I know mm-hmm. we kind of exposed Georgia for everybody last week, but still show up. I mean, come on. I was so, and this is my fault for thinking Kentucky was going to be for real. Come on. Like y'all have got to take that next step. You got too good of a coach to be slacking in the big moments like this. It, I was just, I was very frustrated by this AJ. Me too. Well, and, and again, everybody wants to hype up Kentucky. And here we go. Yeah. Georgia putting them in their place and doing it pretty commandingly with scoring 51 points in that game. So, I mean, that, that makes me feel even better about what we did against Georgia to keep them really like kind of in check during that whole game. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll mention a couple, couple honorable mentions and you've probably seen them. The Georgia tech uh, pulled off the upset against uh, number 17, Miami (laughs) Uh, and living in Atlanta. Like it made me feel so good. Especially Mario Cristobal being a Bama guy. You know, that was hilarious. Yep. 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 And what's funny is, I don't know if you've seen this, Mario Cristobal did the exact same thing at Oregon where he decided to run the ball when he could have just need it and finished the game. So if Mario Cristobal doesn't get the picture here, he's kind of a lost hope when it comes to end of game situation, because that was on him. That's a bad coaching mistake. 
all you Auburn fans that were screaming, he's the right choice. How do you feel right now? <laughs> I didn't course, think about that. From that, of course, from that we end. all have said things that we regret, but still, everybody kept saying Mario Cristobal, Mario Cristobal. I was like, mm, not quite. And this is yeah. a perfect reason why. Yeah, 100%. Another interesting one that I watched uh, was Oklahoma, number 12, uh, beat number three, Texas. And there was lots of hype around Again. this game. Lots of fun. Um, so if you don't, if you haven't seen that one, I, I highly suggest lots of highlights from that one because it was electric, down to the wire kind of stuff, back and forth, back and forth. So yep. there were some fun games this weekend. And uh, Kyle, any other final thoughts before we get out of here and uh, go on and go down to the bayou? Yeah. Well, first off, Jared, if you're listening, you better be bringing me back a souvenir because I'll have a souvenir for you in the mail in the form of a pink slip if I don't. But anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you for having me on as a guest. It's always a joy to join you guys whenever I can. Uh, and we worked out great this week. And um, you may be hearing AJ previously, if, by the time you hear this, on the Auburn Experience Show, if everything works out great tonight, schedule-wise. So uh, we uh, you might want to tune into that, too, if you haven't. Go back and check out episode 50. Otherwise, looking forward to the final annual edition of the Tiger Bowl I will miss it, but not some of the crazy things that give us heartburn about all the LSU. I know, I know. And everybody wants to make it some sort of rivalry, which maybe there is some something there. But I, that's another one that I, I think us not playing them every year, I'm not losing any sleep over it. It keeps Alabama and Georgia, and it gets us to see everybody else more often. I, yeah. will, I will sacrifice the Bayou Bengals. 100%. 100%. So, Jared, or Jared, Kyle, that was the first time I did that. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You were just talking about Jared. I, I was thinking about him. Sorry. Uh, how can the people stay in touch with you, Kyle? If you want to reach out to me on X, Kyle Loomis24, that's how you can get in touch with me there. Of course, follow E2C Network everywhere on YouTube, even the TikToks. Uh, you can find us for all that good stuff as well. Yeah, and uh, you can find me on X. I guess that's what we're saying now. I still want to call it Twitter. I think that's what it's for. Uh, at AJAYJAY underscore. It's always great to be an Auburn Tiger and War Eagle. War Eagle. Thank you for tuning in today's episode on the E2C Network. On your way out, I want to remind you to stop by E2Cnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for all our content across our podcast, YouTube channel, and much more. To stay up to date with us, make sure you're following social media accounts such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. While our content here may always be Auburn sports heavy, if it's orange and blue, it's what we do. War Eagle.